Good evening. Welcome. So we're going to get the panel portion of the evening uh, started. I know many of you are here for many of our programs, uh, and I want to give you a ample opportunity to visit all the tables from the program. So we're going to get started now with the panel portion of the evening. This panel is being live streamed for those of you who are joining us uh, from afar. So I'm thrilled to introduce you to Master's programs here at the Graduate Center of the City University of New York. I'm Julie Sook. I'm the Dean for Master's Programs and also a professor in Liberal Studies, Sociology, and Political Science. And uh, we invited all of you here this evening to experience the thing that I love most about the Graduate Center. Uh, it's that we have 15 Master's Programs and 31 doctoral programs taught by tenured, world-class, research-active faculty drawn from 24 CUNY campuses, all under one glass roof in one building. Uh, so we're all here. We write, we program, we make music, we talk, we listen, uh, and most importantly, we learn and collaborate across the many disciplines. Uh, we, look and we look up and out through our glass uh, skylight and through the uh, windows around the block uh, to the world outside of the university. Uh, and to my mind, master's education is really important uh, in bringing the knowledge that's created here out to all corners of the earth and to industry uh, so that we could take uh, the doctoral level research to where our master's students are exposed and use that to solve real world problems. Uh, and for better or worse, there's no shortage of real world problems that need to be solved by uh, truthful 
and rigorous research. So um, today uh, on the panel this evening, um, we're just going to, in the interest of time, um, we're featuring uh, program directors from some of our newer master's programs, cognitive neuroscience, quantitative methods in the social sciences, data analysis and visualization, uh, and uh, the new MA in biography and memoir, which will be admitting students for the first time for entry in fall 2019. Even if you're not planning to apply to one of these particular programs, uh, we have all 15 programs represented in the tables and in the breakout rooms uh, in this room this evening. Uh, even if you're not going to apply to these particular programs, uh, I hope you'll be proud, uh, as I am, that joining a Graduate Center Master's program connects you to a network of brilliant scholars uh, and publicly oriented research. So tonight from Cognitive Neuroscience, we have Professor Tony Rowe. Uh, he can tell you what our brains look like when we are getting distracted. Uh, from Quantitative Methods in the Social Sciences, QMSS, we have Professor Jeremy Porter, who has collected data on many socially important uh, topics, such as church buildings and fertility. Uh, we have Professor Matt Gold uh, from Data Analysis and Visualization, who is also the director of the program in Digital Humanities. Um, he combines computer programming with literary studies. And then finally, we have Professor Sarah Covington, who's writing a biography of a 17th century figure while also leading a 21st century oral history project of Irish immigrants in Queens. So, uh, and then finally, after you hear from some of our faculty who teach in the master's programs, you'll also hear from uh, Jennifer Furlong from the Office of Career Planning. She'll tell you a little bit about the career services uh, that we provide uh, to masters and doctoral students. Uh, and then Rebecca Dent from the Office of Financial Aid, who will tell you about the financial aid options and the, and the process uh, of financial aid. Uh, and on that note, I just want to say something very important. Um, it's true that we have a very low tuition relative to comparable master's programs in New York, uh, but the real reason you should come is not just for the low tuition, but for the amazing research uh, that we offer here. Uh, and also, uh, we have 15 Dean's Merit Scholarships that will be offered. Uh, and two additional scholarships, in addition to those 15 Dean's Merit Scholarships, we have two additional scholarships um, for the Biography and Memoir Master's Program. And uh, you, should be, you should know that everyone who applies uh, for all of our Master's Programs will be automatically considered for the Dean's Merit Scholarships. And those Merit Scholarships will uh, essentially be uh, a good portion of in-state tuition costs uh, for those who are awarded those uh, scholarships. Uh, and at the close of the live streamed panel, um, we'll leave you to visit the tables. There's food in the back, uh, and, um, and we have many representatives, current students and faculty members from all of the programs um, who are here to talk with you. Uh, and please uh, feel free to approach uh, our um, wonderful admissions team uh, is here. Uh, and I'm here, please feel uh, free to come and introduce yourself and approach any of us uh, with additional questions you might have. So, um, Tony. So, uh, thanks, Julie. Um, so, my name's Tony Rowe. I'm a professor here in the programs in psychology and biology, and I'm also the director of this new Masters of Science program in Cognitive Neuroscience. Uh, we just admitted our inaugural class this past fall, um, and it's uh, been a very exciting program for us uh, here at the Grad Center and throughout New York City um, and all of the CUNY campuses. Uh, for those of you who don't know, Cognitive Neuroscience is a relatively new discipline. That um, term, Cognitive Neuroscience, was coined um, in the 90s, roughly speaking. Um, and it basically describes this new science that's studying essentially how the brain gives rise to our complex cognitive processes like perception and attention, language. How is it that we can understand language in our brains and how is it can, that we can produce language? How do we make complex decisions? Uh, and how do we do problem solving? How do our emotional processes take place? Uh, and give, uh, come about in our brains. 
So, um, so these are some of the various different topics that cognitive neuroscientists study. And here at CUNY, we actually have a very large number of faculty doing cognitive neuroscience research. Uh, here at the Graduate Center itself, my lab is just located one floor down. Um, and there's a large group of individuals who are doing research on language processes, also on the seventh floor. But throughout the CUNY system, there are faculty who are doing research on a lot of these different questions and topics in cognitive neuroscience. We have state-of-the-art facilities here at uh, CUNY. Um, we have a uh, relatively new, it's about uh, 16 months or so old, research dedicated three Tesla MRI scanner from Siemens. It's a Prisma research dedicated scanner. So we can put any one of you into this MRI scanner, show images of you, of, of people or different types of events, sentences and so forth, and look at how your brain gets activated under these different circumstances. And by doing so, we can map out how the human brain does these different types of cognitive operations. So the master's program, as I mentioned, is uh, just started this year. We're very excited about it. Um, it turns out that the majority of the students are enrolled um, full time, but we are starting to incorporate later afternoon classes, and we're, we're planning ahead to maybe incorporate some evening classes as well next uh, fall, where we're doing now the course scheduling. We have one late afternoon class that'll meet from 4.15 to 6.15, and we're in the works of scheduling others. Um, the curriculum is fairly straightforward. It's um, Require, there are six courses that are required, six core courses that are required, and then three electives. It includes a master's thesis course, but the electives are very flexible. You can take courses on things like the neuroscience of consciousness or the neurobiology of motivation. Those two courses are actually what are going to be offered in the fall. They're on my mind because we're doing scheduling for them now. Um, but there are also many other courses that we offer as um, electives as well. Um, we're also offering an um, internship course that can fulfill one of the electives where students from this program can go and work for Google or Facebook or NeuroLeadership. We have a lot of different um, companies that are um, sort of uh, working with us in terms of getting these internships um, on the books and um, on board. Uh, and we already have a couple of students who are um, planning to do internships this first summer. So um, it's a very uh, research-focused program. We match every single student into, who, who's in, admitted into the program into a laboratory to do research on these different types of questions. Um, and essentially, we have about maybe two, three master's students in each of the uh, many different labs in the uh, CUNY system who are doing research in cognitive neuroscience. So it's a pretty uh, individualized um, program in terms of the research component, the coursework is taken um, as a group with your cohort um, and alongside the doctoral students in the neuroscience programs in many of the uh, courses. So um, I think we only have a few minutes to speak, each of us, and there are many others who will want to describe their program, but I'll be here for the duration of this open house. I think um, we don't have a desk with a sign on it, but we're going to be in that breakout room there. Um, and we, sorry, in, the, in that back room. Um, okay, yeah, so it's the breakout room in the back room there. And um, we are also going to have a program specific open house for those of you who are interested on, our, uh, on February 19th from 4.30 to 6.30 p.m. on the fourth floor. You can sign up through the website uh, of the Graduate Center. The admissions office has it on their site. We have it on our site. Um, and I'll go into a lot more detail. I'll give a much longer presentation with slides of all of our different facilities, our MRI scanner, um, and there should hopefully be many faculty who show up to our own program-specific open houses where you can talk to them about their research and see about getting involved in these different types of questions. So um, with that, I'll turn it back to All right, so I'm Jeremy Porter, the director of the Quantitative Methods in the Social Sciences Program. Hard to follow Tony. We don't have a brain scanner, and I won't talk as long as, as Tony either. Um, so we're an interdisciplinary program. We draw on the resources from the Social Sciences programs here at the Graduate Center. 
Most closely, we, we work with sociology, economics, educational psychology, urban education, political science, and all the faculty that are in those programs contribute directly uh, to our own program. Um, we have uh, also uh, closely, closely affiliated with our program a number of research institutes and centers. So the goal of our, each of those research institutes and centers is to um, is to work with real world data and answer socio social science uh, sort of developed research questions and use that data and the analytic techniques we cover in our program to answer questions related to that data. So we work with the Stone Center for Economic Inequality that studies national global level economic inequality issues. We work with the Center for Urban Research which, uh, which work, focuses more on New York City agencies and government issues um, and we work with the, the Demography Institute which is more of an academic, um, an academic uh, institute. Um, we, we have also a 30 credit hour program that's about 10 classes. There's three foundational courses and then there's a thesis course. Our program is much more flexible than some of the other courses. That gives you six courses that you're able to do with what you'd like. So there are four different tracks. There's a data analytics for learning, there's a demography track, there's a spatial or a social inequality track, and then there's a traditional methodology track. So uh, the, the, the curriculum is really flexible. You can come here with a focus on just learning quantitative methods. If you have a background in, in the social sciences, you already have a theoretical understanding of what types of questions to ask, what types of data are out there. We give you the tools to find that data, uh, manage that data, and analyze that data to answer questions. Um, we're also going to have a, a program-specific open house on February 25th, so anybody that's interested in um, coming by to see uh, us or to learn more about the program, I'll have a table to the right, but then we'll also have a, another open house and you'd, you'd be more than welcome to come see us there also. Hi everyone, thanks for coming out tonight. Uh, my name's Matthew Gold. I'm the director of the uh, MA program in Digital Humanities and MS program in Data Analysis and Visualization. Um, so I'll describe each of these programs um, and um, start with the Digital Humanities program, um, which may be a term you haven't heard and you may be wondering what is Digital Humanities, which is actually one of the first things we talk about in our program. Um, basically, the Digital Humanities is an emerging area of study that focuses on the use of computation to answer research questions in the humanities. So in practice, that uh, amounts to taking questions in literary studies, philosophy, history, um, art history, and thinking about how we might approach them either from quantitative angles or by representing them in um, digital form. So for instance, some of this work might involve taking uh, book publications and thinking about how we can make them more interactive and uh, create communities of readers on the web who are annotating a text together. Or it might involve taking a group of digitized text and performing quantitative analyses of them in an effort to understand uh, plot points or how characters change over time or how gender uh, affected authorship over a number of years. Um, so the as you can tell, digital humanities is a rather broad name uh, because the humanities themselves are broad. But what uh, practitioners of digital humanities share is a kind of um, attitude and a kind of hands-on uh, desire to, to work with data and to bring that into their humanistic study. Um, so our program has three areas of focus. There is uh, textual studies, which primarily focuses on um, analyzing digitized text, but also creating textual editions. Um, there is digital pedagogy, which builds on the Graduate Center's strength in thinking about how to teach with technology. Um, and then there are, our third specialization is data visualization, thinking about represent, representing data in visuals, visual form and communicating trends in data through visualization. Um, we have a very specific approach uh, that we take in our data uh, digital humanities classes. Um, we 
tend, we believe that um, digital skills, computational skills, are learned best not in isolation, uh, but in partnership and communication with others. So our first act is really to build community among our students and to integrate them into the wider uh, program of support at the Graduate Center that we have uh, for digital scholarship. Um, among a number of other hats I wear at the Graduate Center, um, I direct our digital initiatives, uh, which is thinking very broadly about how to integrate technology into the academy. Um, so we run tons of workshops. One of the things you'll discover, no matter what program you enter here, um, you'll discover that there's a workshop and probably more than one workshop going on every evening of the week. Um, our workshops in digital humanities cover everything from introduction to Python to how to build a digital portfolio on the web uh, to um, introduction to um, data visualization all the way up through machine learning. Um, we also, another key element of our approach um, is not, we, we, while we have, uh, we have uh, practices and methods that we want to teach our students, we foreground the students' own research questions. So a lot of our projects ask students to take um, the methods that we've been working through with them, whether they be related to geospatial data, practices and methods or um, computational textual analytic methods and to apply them to a subject of their choosing. Um, what we find is that we, we, that you out there, you bring your interests and your questions to our program and that's what makes it lively and exciting. Um, so uh, because of that, what we try to do is we try to uh, uh, foster each student's own individual research questions and have them explore them in our programs. And as a result, the projects that come out of our programs are really, um, we're surprised by them every term. Um, we, in, we just finished our intro to uh, DH class this past fall. Some of the projects that came out of that class um, the proposed projects that came out include a project on uh, DH in prisons, uh, thinking about how to teach computational skills to uh, uh, prisoners who don't have access uh, to the internet. So there's lots of thinking through about what it means to do digital humanities, how it can be done, um, and, and all sorts of uh, work about around curriculum development there. Um, other projects um, include uh, thinking about um, uh, databases and how databases are constructed, scholarly databases, and how the research that is done within databases um, is kind of constrained by the assumptions with which they are built. Um, so our students have gone on from the DH program to a variety of uh, positions um, in the commercial sector, uh, doing things like um, some digital marketing work, sometimes textual analysis work, um, sometimes in the cultural uh, sector. Um, or, or uh, organizations like the Open Science Foundation doing data analysis. Um, our data visualization and um, uh, analysis program brings a combination of uh, data analysis, data viz, um, and data studies, critical data studies. Um, and our approach in that program is really to say that um, data visualization is not a kind of completely transparent uh, 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 kind of skill or method, but that it is, we, we try to bring to it an understanding of aesthetics of data visualizations as constructed artifacts, um, and we try to help students develop uh, critical approaches to data visualization uh, that include approaches based on arts practices and also a strong sense of, of data ethics. Um, both of, both of these programs are very flexible. Um, our co courses are primarily offered in the evenings, either in the 4.15 to 6.15 time slot or primarily in the 6.30 to 8.30 time slot. Um, and um, both of them, they, they, they share some courses and they, they share a space. Um, and uh, we will be having an open house for both of these programs on February 20th. Um, so I would invite you uh, to come to them or to, to uh, speak to those of us at the table afterwards. Um, and finally, I just want to say on a, on a personal note, um, I'm not only a faculty member here at the Graduate Center, but I'm also um, a graduate of this institution. Um, I came here after doing an MA at another institution, um, and I immediately fell in love with this place, and I've been here ever since. Um, and I can just tell you that you can't go wrong by selecting any of these programs. The Graduate Center is a wonderful place to be uh, and to learn. Thank you. Hi, my name is uh, Sarah Covington. I'm a professor of history here at the Graduate Center. 
and at Queens College, and um, I'm the new director of the new program in uh, biography and memoir. I think what's what's striking about this program is it's the it's one of only two in the country, in this country, and really the, the only dedicated MA program in, in the subject of biography and memoir. There are a lot of these programs in the United Kingdom at Oxford and Sussex, but none here. So um, I think it's, it's a, a very, very exciting and innovative um, uh, sort of development. As I don't have to tell you what biography and memoir is, but it's, it's an exploding uh, field. It's always been hugely popular. There are always kind of new areas of memoir and, and biography that are developing. I, I think of um, who kind of focus on disability memoirs, for example, or mental illness memoirs, or immigrant memoirs. So it's a constantly growing field. And what we have to offer is, is a way for you to um, study it systematically and give you the tools, um, both creative and scholarly, to pursue um, both those genres. and, and on also developing um, uh, oral history, which is also flourishing. Um, I direct the oral history of the Irish in Queens, and um, Columbia has a great program as well in that. So any sort of what they call life writing is what we cover. Um, it's hugely interdisciplinary. We're, we're based out of the, the history. Well, we're a standalone, but we work closely with history and English. But um, after taking the four courses that you're required to take, then you then you can do whatever you want in, in your electives. You can do anthropology, art history, um, cognitive science. Um, I'm not sure how quantitative would fit in. There, I think there are quantitative biographies. or You could quantify your life in a memoir. Uh, you know, there are uh, anthropology. You know, I think I mentioned psychology. So it, it gives you a real exposure um, to, to so many um, opportunities. We also work very closely. We're affiliated with the Leon Levy Center. And uh, my colleague there, we're at the table in the back, and he can tell you more. But that's directed by a Pulitzer Prize-winning um, biographer, Kai Bird. And uh, there are a lot of very renowned biographers working out of memoirists, working out of the Graduate Center, um, David Nassau, Blanche Wiesen Cook. Um, Others. So another another opportunity it gives you is to work um, in close mentorship with these these biographers in a city that's at the center of the publishing field. So if you would like to be a published writer, if you'd like to use the program to uh, go farther for a PhD, um, there's um, not only are historians, for example, um, biographers, but there's a huge um, interest in how other wrote biographies and and the history of biographies the history of memoirs for the from the ancient world through medieval early modern 19th century so it's um it, it's very exciting in in that way and um, and in terms of future careers um, aside from using it to um, head to your PhD if you're interested in that you can work in journalism you can work at think tanks you can work in digital media um, I mean, social media itself is a form of life writing, and so that's encompassed better and worse, um, but that's encompassed in all of this as well. So I think the, the courses you're required to take are the art of biography, where you study biography and memoir uh, in the past, uh, research methods, um, how to really solidify, how to, how to do research um, in archives, in libraries, um, the ethics of Biography and memoir. Uh, what are the ethics of writing about your family? Um, you know, what what is the impact of you writing on your family? Very personal things, um, for example. Um, so that that's a very interesting program as well. Um, and so uh, I, I, it's it's very exciting. You would be part of this this first this first year of the program, and uh, and you'll also be required to do your thesis or a capstone. Program. Project, which would, um, you know, force you to write uh, biographically or, or memoiristically. So um, it, it's got a lot of advantages, and, and um, I'm extremely excited um, to be directing this. And I, I should add to Matt's comment that I'm a very graduate of the Graduate Center as well, and uh, it gave me so much. And uh, so I hope um, you think about attending 
here, and especially you hope to, to, that you, you think about attending or, or being part of the free memoir program. So I think uh, there's a lot of other panelists, but I'll end with that. So thank you. Hi everyone, I'm Jenny Furlong and I direct the Office of Career Planning and Professional Development here at the Graduate Center. Welcome, uh, especially if this is your first time in the building. In my experience of, of many years of working with graduate students on career issues, uh, many reasons bring folks back to a master's program. Sometimes it's just pure intellectual curiosity. Sometimes it's a desire to test the waters for doctoral education. And sometimes it's a real tangible desire to move forward in their professional career in a way that they, they feel like they can't without the degree. And we hope to, along with your faculty, support you in these goals, whatever, whatever they might be. Uh, we have to facilitate conversations between GC students and employers via our jobs database, GC Connect information sessions with employers, connections with alumni and career fairs. Uh, we provide one-on-one -on -one career uh, advising, um, advising on things like as general as career strategy. Where should I go? What should I do? Uh, what's the right fit for me? Um, advice on how to network, how to um, connect your skills to a particular job opportunity via well-written job documents, resumes, cover letters, LinkedIn profiles, how to interview, so that really hands-on kind of stuff that uh, all of us need help with from time to time. We give a broad range of workshops and programs to help you prepare for your next step professionally, and we put a lot of this online as well in case you are not at the GC all the time. Many of our master's degree students work, so we make ourselves available via phone and um, go to meeting conversations. We can also meet with you later in the afternoon or evening before your class or after your class, depending on what your schedule is. Also within our office, we offer peer-to-peer -peer writing consultations, that is advanced doctoral students who help other graduate students with their academic writing, be they seminar papers, um, answering a call for papers for a conference, master's theses, or anything in between. Uh, and these students also facilitate writing groups and workshops to help you get your academic writing done. So if maybe it's been a while since you've been in a degree program and are worried about that aspect of the work, we definitely have folks who can help you. In my office, we also have the, um, we supervise the work of the quantitative research consulting a center, and that's peer-to-peer -peer assistance with statistics. So if you are thinking about coming to some of our new quantitative programs and maybe are a little nervous about whether those skills are, are where they need to be to do graduate coursework there, we also have folks who can help you with that. Right now we have two very lovely st uh, doctoral students, one from economics and one from educational psychology who, who do some of that work with their peers. So I would really encourage you to uh, talk to our faculty members here. They're wonderful. Um, and I hope to see you at the Graduate Center someday. Uh, please note that if you matriculate here, you will get a lot of email from me in my office. And I just ask you to please read it, because um, I think a lot of times students miss out on opportunities when they don't read those emails. So thank you very much, and enjoy your evening. Hi, my name is Rebecca Dent. I'm an associate director in the Office of Fellowship and Financial Aid, which is right downstairs on the seventh floor. I will just piggyback on Jenny's comment that yes, please always read your emails whenever you come from financial aid. A lot of information does get out that way. So now that you've heard all about our wonderful programs, and this really is a very special place. Um, it's the only place I've ever worked where every degree under the sun is all being housed together and it's it's really incredible to sort of see students from all different disciplines all come together in the same place now you have to figure out how you're going to pay for it uh, which is what i do 
Um, I'm going to first, Dean Sook mentioned the scholarships. Those are determined, again, all students that are admitted are automatically considered. My office does not actually make those decisions, and I say that because I tend to get a lot of questions about that. Um, but I will be glad to assist you and get you in touch with the right people anytime. Um, we have two major types of financial aid, fellow uh, work study and financial aid in the form of loans. One thing, if you are new to graduate education and coming from undergrad, it is a very different world for graduate students. Uh, the government does not provide um, grants to graduate students. Uh, it's not, there's no Pell Grants available, it's another common question. It's, I don't agree with it, but that is the situation we're in. Students can borrow through the Federal Student Loan Program. They can borrow for the entire cost of attendance, and that includes living expenses. Many students that attend here are part-time, they're working, you don't need to take anything that you don't need, but it is always there for you if you, if you do. There is a couple things that you have to do you're accepted, all you have to do to be considered for federal student aid here at the Grad Center is file a FAFSA, which is just the free application for federal student aid. You've done it for undergrad, no doubt. Um, every student that files is automatically considered for loans as well as work study, which work study means you are placed in a job on campus and then you then earn money in the form of you get a paycheck. Um, from the office itself, not actually distributed through the student accounting services, but the, about the hours that you are working. Um, you need, there's a couple requirements you have to meet. Um, you have to be enrolled, what we call half time, which here is six credits. Uh, so if you're taking anything less than that, you just, you don't qualify for those programs. You also have to be a U.S. citizen or eligible non-citizen, such as a permanent resident. Um, if you have any questions about that, you're welcome to contact our office anytime. We have, I'm there, you know, every day. We all have a walk-in. There's, I mostly work with master's students, but we have a whole, I have a whole group of colleagues that can always answer your questions too if you come in a time that I happen not to be there. Um, I hope that you'll really consider doing everything that you think you need to do and never worry that an, an education is an investment in your future. So I always want students to not let the cost be a deterrent to thinking that this is something that you cannot do. Uh, another service we provide, we do uh, financial literacy, mostly um, in the, like, for example, when you're getting ready to graduate, we do sessions about how to repay your loans, what that means, how to restructure the payments. Often students find that it's a lot more flexible than they may have thought. Um, we're also rolling out budgeting initiatives. Students learn how to, how to live on a budget and what's important. Um, and in the future, we're probably going to be doing more long-term financial planning. And we're always interested in hearing feedback from any of you. So I won't keep you from talking to your programs any longer. I hope you'll consider applying, and good luck. Thank you. So that concludes the discussion. Instead of having a formal question and answer period, um, we're just going to have all of our uh, program representatives at the tables uh, answering any questions you might have. Um, some of the programs, instead of having a table, will have a breakout room. So cognitive neuroscience, which room is, is in there? Data science in here. That one? Okay, data science in there. Liberal studies in the back over here. Uh, and then uh, Jenny and Rebecca will be, actually, why don't you actually stay up here instead of going into a breakout room? So um, Jenny and Rebecca will be uh, in the front if you have questions about career planning and financial aid. Uh, and, and you'll be able to find all the programs. Many of our programs are uh, related to each other in interesting ways. So I would also encourage you at this particular open house uh, to visit more than one table. Visit a table that uh, you didn't know about uh, before you came in. Uh, and find out about the, the programs, because some of the programs do have overlapping areas uh, of study uh, and um, overlapping uh, elective courses, so it might be useful to, to find out about those programs. And also, our admission staff is here. Uh, many of the directors mentioned program-specific open houses. We will be having open houses uh, with more faculty in attendance uh, in the programs themselves throughout February and March. Uh, including a lunch event for the Biography and Memoir uh, MA on March 6th, 
Uh, if you're interested in that, please uh, ask uh, Professor Covington about it uh, when you visit the biography table. But uh, many of the programs will be having events, so make sure you get in more specific information about those events um, when you visit the tables. So thank you very much, and enjoy the evening.